Thank you, sister. Yeah. I'm gonna stick these back in the bag. Yeah. Sacrament of reconciliation and also the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. We ask for your intercession through your mother, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I'm Father Carl. Um, I'm a recently ordained priest. I was just ordained in July, July 11th. And so this is my second career. I was, before that, I was an accountant. And so, uh, for 25 plus years. And so this is my first assignment here at Cathedral. So, so I'm new to this. But reconciliation is what we're going to talk about first. And it happens to be one of my favorite sacraments to, to minister. So, so that works out really good today. So the other, so we're going to talk about two things today, the two sacraments. The sacrament of reconciliation, which is this blue book, and we'll just follow along in this book, okay? And then the second one, and we'll get this to this at the, at the end, is the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. So it's a, a little bit, it's the same size book, but it's a little bit quicker. It kind of base, it's kind of flows from the second of reconciliation. Okay. So if we open these books, years ago, when some people still call it like, the second of penance or confession, and after the, I guess, probably the eighties, they start we changed it to the sacrament of reconciliation. Because what it is is we reconcile ourselves with God. Okay, so we sin, and then, as you can see here, the steps in this sacrament are confession, or contrition, confession, absolution, and then we are reconciled. Okay? And some people still call it confession and penance, so that's, those two are parts of the overall sacrament. But in the end, what we're doing is reconciling ourselves with God. And if we go back to the whole basis of it, and if we look through the history of the reconciliation, we won't go through it uh, in, in, you can always go back to this because it would be way too long, but in the early church, they started with, with it was really baptism. And this is kind of interesting, this, this seems like it's almost impossible to do. But once baptism, once a person was baptized, the person was expected to lead a sinless life forever and afterwards. So once, and there's actually stories of people that would wait till basically their deathbed to get baptized because that way they wouldn't have any sins on them. So they knew they couldn't be perfect. None of us are perfect, so we all sin. So they were trying to, to wait. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so the development of reconciliation came about later in the second and third, um, second to the fifth centuries, we can see that people that were really scandalous were excommunicated. And then there were really no second chances given, okay? And then what they did was they changed, they, they, we started this history, this service of penance, but look, if you see this, canonical penance could be received only one time. And another sin that permanent excommunication. So you got one chance. That's kind of harsh. So if you, you see, that's when they really started the, the harshness of, because of the harshness of the penance, most people reserved it until they were on their deathbed. So it's baptism and then confession after we started with confession. Mm -hmm. 
The other thing was, and I, I don't see it in here, but it was actually public. So you were publicly <laughs> professed your sins, like in the back, like in the steps of the church somewhere. Okay. And then it says here, 6th through 12th century, it became private, the way we do it today. And this is the other thing they did was that, so for these sins you had this punishment, these sins you had this punishment. There was no, the priest didn't have to think about what the punishment was going to be. And, and we shouldn't even look at it as punishment, okay? That's what the way it was looked at then. But then later, we, um, it's really been changed to where we are today. So now, it's considered the, the sacrament of reconciliation. So the first step is, when you come into it, and we got the little cards here, mm -hmm. which kind of goes through the steps. The first step is to acknowledge that you're a sinner. You know, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And the Father, the priest, is acting in persona Christi, so we're acting as sitting in for Christ at that moment in time. Okay? And the other thing I need to say, and I'll probably say it a couple times, is that anything that happens in the confessional, anything you say, cannot be repeated by the priest. Okay? It can not. There is a, the seal of confession is what it's called. And right now, at least, I can't think of any place in the world that it's not accepted, even in the legal system. So if you came in and you said that you murdered somebody, the priest, of course, would have to absolve you from your sins, but he can't say anything. He can't tell the authorities. The authorities question him. He could not do anything, okay? So the one thing to remember is that seal is forever, and it's permanent, and it can't be broken for anything, not even by the legal system, okay? And that is recognized at least. I can't think of any place that's not recognized. Can you, Brother? I think California tried to overturn it. They tried. All the priests in California said, yeah, there's something to that. Yeah. And, 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 but right now, the Supreme Court, I don't think, would ever yeah, uphold it. So, we're good in this country, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I, I just want to make sure that that is, because it's something that I don't think people outside the Roman Catholic Church really fully understand is, the, is that seal of confession and how tight that is. And if a priest were to say anything about something that happened, he can actually be excommunicated. I mean, it's like severe punishment for the priest through the church if he were ever caught saying something that, about someone else's sins. So it's what goes on in the, I don't mean in a weird way, but what is said in there during the confessional stays there with the priest, the priest. And I know a lot of priests, including myself, that one of the gifts that we received from the Holy Spirit during ordination was that, yeah, I can't remember what people said when they leave. So as soon as you leave, it's just like, it's out of my, my own mind. So I, I got a pretty good memory on it. So, but anyway, so the term reconciliation, what that is, is, so the first step is that confession of sins. Okay, and you go through this little step here. And usually, after you confess your sins, the priest will kind of talk to you a little bit about maybe something you're struggling with, if you're struggling with, um, say, one of your sins was gossiping. Um, the priest may talk to you a little bit about the ramifications of gossiping and uh, ways to change that attitude or that, that, that inclination of wanting to gossip or something, and how to change that into a positive. Um, it was gossiping. Well, one thing with gossiping is we have to remember how that can affect other people and how it affects us when people gossip about us. So those are usually ways that we can immediately think, ooh, I should not be doing that. And it's, it's one of them. It's a common sense. It was, it's a common uh, trait for humans to want to do that and stuff. Uh, looking at things we shouldn't on the internet, stuff like that. Those are some common things. And after, after you've confessed your sins, so the priest will talk to you a little bit about it and try to give you some advice. Maybe you can even ask for advice from the priest during the confessional. 
And again, these things that are done and said to the priest or the priest says to you, those are between you and God. The priest can't say anything. And after that, you make a act of contrition, which, well, there's one written down here, but it's in such small print, I don't know if you can read it on the back side of this one. It should be in this book, too. Oh, wait, you know what? It's on this other sheet of paper. This one's easier to read. Over here. But a lot of times, priests will ask you just to say from your heart. And from your heart, what you're doing is telling God that you admit that you have sinned and that you want to do better and that you've sinned because you love Him, He loves you, and you're going to try to do better in the future. And that you'll try to atone for your sins, which is the penance that the priest will give you. And the, the penance is and a way to look at that that I've always heard was. So if you throw, if you're a little kid, you throw a baseball and hit your neighbor's window, and it breaks the window. You can apologize for that, but you still need to make atonement for that. Usually, you need to pay for that window that the neighbor may forgive you, but you still have to do something to make it right. And so that's what the penance is here. Depending on the priest, most priests are pretty easy with their penance. So, usually, um, I usually try to make it so that it's something that will benefit you at the same time as, as you're doing the penance to God. It's also building your relationship with God at the same time as, as doing something extra. I mean, it's usually for me, it's usually just doing something extra. A couple of Hail Marys sometimes, uh, sometimes just sitting in talking to Jesus about what is going on here in the Blessed Sacrament. Any questions so far? It's all kind of new to all of you, or? Uh, I'm kind of familiar with my mom. She's a Catholic, so she's done her sacrament. So oh, okay. Us, but um, she speaks mostly Spanish. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, and I don't yeah. speak any Spanish. <laughs> but she understands a little bit. Oh, okay. But okay. our family, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, my like, cousin, yeah, like our, uh, her cousins in the Dominican Republic, they're nuns. So oh, she, so you're familiar with the yeah, Polish sacrament? Yeah, we just never did our sacrament. Yeah, okay. 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 So you're kind of familiar with the Polish yeah, sacrament? Yeah, she was raised like in a family, basically. Um, Oh, yeah. okay. so and you, have you been familiar with reconciliation a little bit or not? Um, a little bit because my mom is a Catholic, she just converted though, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. This is all new. It's all new for you, but is it kind of making a little bit of sense yeah. here? In that entryway in the corner, in that vestibule, okay. there's one, there's a restroom back there. So she's just got to go yeah. right Yeah, just the turn, go down the ramp to the right, and it's just in the corner there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And it says don't use, but ignore that. Dice que no, dice tiene un letrero que no se puede usar, pero usa. There was a scriptural basis of the, of, the, of the process, and I was trying to find uh, where those were. Okay, so that's the, that's the penance when it's one person with one person. Mm -hmm. And that's the normal process, okay? Sometimes you'll hear of a communal reconciliation, 
And usually what that is, is like during Advent and Lent, we'll gather together sometimes in the evening or in the afternoon, and there will be a prayer service beforehand, and reading of scripture. And it's usually 15 minutes, half an hour, somewhere in there. And then, one by one, everybody will come to reconciliation. Those came about, I believe, in the 70s after Vatican II, and I don't know how much they're really used that much anymore. I'm not, I'm not seeing it as much, because it's, it's a lot for people to come to those because of other demands on our time. So I think it's people more often come, like Saturday we have it here from 3 o'clock to 3.45 on Saturday afternoon, and people will come to, with the when you come to the priest on your own. And that's been kind of more common from what I've seen. Um, what have you guys seen? Have you seen many communal ones? Uh, we had a general application over the summer. But yeah, that's the next step I was going to go through here. And this is, this is an, this is an exposure. And we did it this year, which is general absolution. And that is in times of crises where it's almost impossible for people to come individually and confess their sins individually, the priest will do a general absolution. The only thing is that, and it, it says it in here, it's on page 13, the last step, number 14, is that you're still obligated if you have committed serious sin and you'll you can find those serious sin or obviously murder is one of them. It's serious sin is a hard definition. You'll find it in the catechism, but uh, you'll know. <laughs> so you're you're obligated to do still confess those even after a general absolution. I don't know what we're going to do this year during Lent yet because the with so many cases of coronavirus, we had a whole day of confession that we were trying to plan in December, so we'll have like five hours of it with ten priests total, two, or two priests an hour each, so they did it last year and had like 400 people that came through, so it was just, it wasn't a communal service, it was you came and did a confession, it was just a day when we, everybody knew that for these five hours you could come to the cathedral and come to confession. I don't know if we're going to do that because of, I don't know if we can find enough priests <laughs> that are not in a high risk category. So I don't know if we're going to do that. That's really nice. But that doesn't really apply to you guys. So, um, but uh, those are the different kinds of confession that we do. Now, what I was going to do then is show you how this actually works in for the real experience. The other thing, before we do that, let's go through this. This is getting ready to do your to, to go to accept the reconciliation. Kind of, it hasn't been told. And what this is, is an examination of conscience. And I think on the back side, Somewhere on here it says it's for children. I think we're all children that part. Because it says here, a children's examination of conscience and guidance. I think we're all children at heart. So, do you have one of these, Robert? Do you think this is really for children or for everybody? Uh, I don't know. See? <laughs> so, it kind of, and this is kind of a good thing I think that churches should actually have is a little brochure like this. Every, you know, at the front of the church or something. And so this is a nice examination of conscience. And this one, you can, there's a lot of different examinations of conscience that you can find. And there's actually, believe it or not, there's apps for that. So this one goes through the command, Ten Commandments. So the first one, I'm going to God before me. And then some things to think about. Okay. And on each one of these, it's the same way. 
it's some things to examine yourself in your own mind. Mm -hmm. Have I done these things? And there's other, like I said, there's other examinations of conscious that just really kind of go deeper. And, and uh, really kind of more direct yourselves toward um, changing your life. So this one is kind of basic, but I think we're, I think it's a good one actually. And then at the end of it, it actually has that act of contrition that I was saying. Okay, so far? Good. Do you Thank have you. to do like, um, Thank you. do you have to go to reconciliation every time before taking the Eucharist, or is just only when you have committed some? One, only when it's grave sin. Okay. And those are in the catechism. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. definition, I mean, those definitions are usually um, yeah. murder is one of them, grave sin would be adultery. Um, there's a listing in there mm -hmm. of grave sins. And once you do an examination of conscience, most people will know what in, in their own heart, whether they believe it's a grave sin. And going through the, the, the catechism will help you, but we all know in our heart, I think. So, um, and even when that comes, like if you, if you've committed a grave sin, but you come to Mass, and you still want to receive communion, you have to at least, because it's not always easy to get to confession in today's world. You know, you come to communion with the understanding in your own mind that you're going to get to confession as soon thereafter. Okay? So, and that's... Here it's, especially since we have it every week, it's not as bad as some other, some other parishes, maybe. So, it's harder in other parishes where they don't have as many... You know, if you have one priest covering four masses, it's hard for him to have confessions before every mass. But I'm going to show you an example of how we do, how the process works, if you want. So let's come over here. Is that okay? I'm just going to show you here because I've just got my all set up the way I do it. Set up this way. These a lot of churches took these out after Vatican II, 
and now they're just like a little screen between the priest and them. Like you might be in a room, but there's just a little like a room divider screen. It's still pretty, I like this setup better, so but I believe it or not, most people come face to face. So I have very few that come with it. I carry with me an act of contrition. I every night before I go to bed. And you know, at a certain point, I mean, uh, my question was, the priest is going to ask you to make an act of contrition. And we'll keep on here. There's one hanging on the wall, and there's one here. So we keep one. I always make sure there's one handy. So there's one on the table on that side. I've got one here. So. At a certain point, the priest has to know that you truly are sorry for your sins. And that's what an act of contrition is. Declaration that I firmly resolve to talk about God's grace and not to do this anymore, whatever it is. And then, you know, uh, last year we had a different priest here uh, on the feed. Services also for reconciliation services. But there are some people that come probably monthly, some even more often than that. Because it is very. And I, you guys talked about other sacraments already, right? right? Yeah. So every time you receive a sacrament, you're receiving grace, mm -hmm. and that grace pours into you from God. God's always offering grace. But our sins kind of block that grace from coming fully in. So when you're reconciliation, you're really allowing a lot of grace in. 
So every time you come to the sacrament of reconciliation, you're receiving grace, and you're opening yourself up for even more grace. And so a lot of people will come um, more often. I go, I try to go every few weeks. So it's harder for our priests to go because we have to find a priest that would, because you know, we don't, I, I go with one of the athletes. So. The Holy Spirit will help you by laying guilt upon you. You know, a little bit, you'll, you'll feel a little, I, I need to go to confession, you know, I need to get this off of my, my shoulders, it's too heavy, I don't want to carry it any longer, you know, move on. Yeah, seeing here kind of shows what most modern churches are. So there's like this little room divider thing. The other thing that happens is many of us have the same sins over and over and over that we commit. It's just part of our human nature. So the more often you're in confession, a lot of people find those graces that God has works on with you is to help change your own habits. Um, I'll go back to the first example I used of gossiping. If you come every week or every two weeks and confess the sin of gossiping, and if you work with the priest, the priest will probably give you some help on how to uh, work toward uh, not committing that same sin over and over and over. Um, and in today's world, <laughs> pornography is obviously in <laughs> Um, to not even realize that everybody heard it, not everybody, it's just very rare. So, that could be a sin that people do, is viewing the pornography online, or dirty jokes online, and stuff like that. And so those are things that, the more often we confess, then sometimes God's grace will help you overcome those same types of, if you want to come addictions, or, or whatever, you commit in the same sins all over and over. And then, so that's the other thing that sac the Sacrament of Reconciliation offers is uh, graces to be able to live mm -hmm. a life closer with the life that God wants us to be. Okay? Okay, then the other sacrament that we were going to cover today, this is going faster than I thought it would, <laughs> is the anointing of the sick. And along with confession, it's one that is, can be very healing. Uh, it's one that gives us very special graces. And you can, it's, it's amazing what it can do. It's, very, it's a very powerful sacrament. Um, it can help with physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, psychological healing, and I've actually seen it actually like change people because you can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit working in that person as soon as the priest does the anointing. 
And if you look here on page 6, there's a quote here from James. Are there any among you sick? They shall call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will forgive. So in the process of this anointing, you also are forgiven your sins. Depending on how sick you are, it's best to go to confession in the middle of the anointing of the sick. So the whole, the whole sacrament doesn't take that long. But in the middle of it, there's a spot in the middle of the whole sacrament uh, for reconciliation, so confess your sins. Sometimes people are too sick to do that if they're in a hospital bed or whatever the other reasons are. So at that point, your sins would be forgiven um, by the priest during the anointing. So, have you received anointing? Father Steve, when he was here, mm -hmm. every first Friday of the month, he would have anointing of the sick right after his morning mass. Okay. And we would all have anointing together. But if you know you're going to have a serious operation or, or something, you should uh, ask the priest for the anointing of the sick. You know, uh, we used yeah. to do it only in case you were about to die. You know. Well, that was that was before Vatican II. Yeah, that was before so, Vatican II. A long time ago. Yeah. But some older people still believe that you can only have it once. Oh yeah. Because it used yeah. to be called um, what was it called? Ex extreme unction. Extreme unction, but there was that was the Latin word. I can't remember what it was called. But anyway, my mom used to always have another word for it. Um, but you received it when you were basically close to death. Mm -hmm. You're on your deathbed, is what they used to do. That's been changed. The whole theology of it has been changed because we realize that the healing powers can work for us as we're sick, not just when we're uh, near death. And a lot of people will come before they have surgery. That's when I think I do most of them, is before surgery. Unfortunately, people in the hospital will not really need an anointing of the sick, oftentimes. And right now, we can't visit people in the hospital because right now, it has, it has been, for the most part, since the coronavirus started, is first nobody was allowed in, and now they allow one person in per day. Is that the, what you guys know? Yes. Yeah. And most of the hospitals are, they only allow one visitor, and then that's it. But we have a chaplain. You have a chaplain, but is it a priest? He's not a priest. Okay. Well, he's just a chaplain, but yeah. he does go in and gives the He prays with them. Yeah, he prays with them. Yeah. So Saint Elizabeth has a priest on staff, so he can do. Yeah, he, he can do anointings. Mm -hmm. um, but like, if I were to go in to anoint somebody, then I'm that one person per day, mm -hmm. and that's and most people have husbands, wives, children that really want to go in. And so, unfortunately, it usually doesn't work out for the priest to be the one. Mm -hmm. so. I really miss that, that Father Steve used to do that on the first Friday of the mm -hmm. month. You know, every, every first Friday he would stand there, I'd hold the oil for him, and then he would put it on the people and say the words of, of the blessing. You know, and it was... Yeah, I'll... I'll be, I have to do my work out just to go through the process. The, the sacrament is actually pretty straightforward. It's, um... It opens up with a prayer. Usually, you're reading from James that we just read from. Uh, and then the priest will lay, your hand, lay his hands on the person's uh, forehead, on their head. And then he anoints him and it's through this whole, and then he actually rubs the holy oil 
um, in which you can see it in the case back there. I'll show you the kind of way out. I'll show you. Oh, we go out, but there's there's a cabinet there with three big pictures, yes. and the, the whole. And those are the oils that the bishop blesses during holy. And then he rubs those the oil on your forehead. Uh, he does it only on the man. Lord and His love and mercy help you with the grace of the Lord. And he anoints, he anoints your hands you. too. Yeah, then He anoints your hands. Mm -hmm. And if there's any particular body parts that, yeah, if you're going to have heart surgery or something, something like that, he might. Something. So yeah, it's kind of he has to be a little bit sensitive. And then, and then a prayer, the Lord's prayer, and then um, and there's a prayer after the anointing. And of course, there's special prayers for whether it's for surgery or young person. Um, Long-term illness, short-term illness. But if you have someone at home that is sick and possibly dying or living out their last days, call a priest. You know, he'll come to visit your home. Oh, that's what mommy smelled about last rites. That's what she always called it. <laughs> so you wait until the very end. So that's the that's the anointing. Okay. Any questions about anointing? No. How about reconciliation? Do you get the connection between the healing of the body and the healing of the soul? One is confession, one is the blessing of, of, of the holy oils. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to take one part of your body and or one part of your psyche, your soul, your spiritual life, your physical life, your mental health, everything is, you work in hospitals, so you know this, everything is tied together. It's, it's hard to say you're healing one part versus I'm mean, going to do like the whole thing. You visit and you do mentally, but you're not safe mentally or actually, you know, have a good, I don't want to say a good mentality, but if you're depressed mentally, you're more mm -hmm. likely going to be feeling it physically. So yeah. most of the patients that come in are sick, but they're more sick because they know they're dying or because they're depressed and dying, and then they end up their bodies feel even worse, even though mm -hmm. you might check their vitals and it may be perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, so it, it's a connection and we do see that. And I do want to add one thing. Yeah, and the, the, I want to add a little bit to that, to spiritual health, which most people, especially in a hospital situation, get it, that gets ignored oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Unless you have good chaplains, which you, you have chaplains. Yeah, so. we have, well, depending on the hospital, they do sometimes have priests. I worked in one in Chicago where they did have a chaplain that was a priest, so uh -huh. he was able to do like Ash Wednesday and he was able to okay. give it to us, mm -hmm. um, especially the ones who worked overnight and things like that. So, um, or did the anointment you know, of the sick as well, you know, they did do that. But uh, I have a question, so you can only do it though if you are baptized, correct? You can only receive the, the anointing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, I think that most people probably aren't going to... I mean, what ends up happening is, like, if I came upon a car accident and somebody said, can you anoint this person? I'm not going to... Do, do they receive all the sacraments? I mean, you're, you're going to do the anointing. I mean, you, you have to do... You have to do what... Um, in emergency situations, you're going to do what you need to do to be on the safe side. So, you know, if that person doesn't believe in God, then the anointing isn't going to be effective because they have no belief there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I can't say that it wouldn't be effective because I don't know that. Right. So, but, it, you know, it's that person's d disposition also. So, but uh, this is one of the sacraments, yeah, that we would normally think that you should be baptized for. Mm -hmm. So, like, the whole baby, you know, comes in. Well, if it's a baby, normally, normally if you baptize the baby, the, you know, as a baby, you're not going to have any sin. So if you, if you were to baptize that baby, you know. but you can anoint the person right after the baptism, I think. Okay. So, 
But normally with a baby, you can baptize that person or bless the person. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because I think it's just really tough anyway, because mm-hmm. when you see sick children, it's just really Yeah, hard. we see a lot of sick babies that come on and sometimes don't make it past the day as well. But, yeah. Um, normally, yeah, normally if you baptize a person, I mean, we believe that baptism cleans, it takes away all your sins. So normally you would expect that person to be all right with God at that point, right? So. Okay, so if a person gets in a motor vehicle accident and they weren't baptized, would they be able to get baptized, right? Yeah, and it doesn't have, like he said, it doesn't have to be a priest at that point. You can, anybody can pour water over a person's forehead and say, baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it can count as a baptism? We would, we would church would recognize that as a baptism. Okay. If you use those exact words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's just the Father and the Son. Okay. So, but yeah. Um, because, I mean, I know people who have been baptized by their grandparents because the kids have fallen away from the church, and the grandparents will baptize the baby in the sink. So, oh, it was her sister. Oh, it was her sister, yeah. Because she, they, they were all born at home. Sister Tess is old enough that she was born at home. And one of her sisters was really sick when she was born. And they baptized her right there in the kitchen sink. We will have baptism on the vigil of Easter. You know, you guys that aren't baptized. Yeah, who's baptized? You're baptized? Yeah. Baptized? Baptized? Um, we, we, we aren't. No, no, no baptism? No. Okay. 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 So you'll be so baptized. baptized when these classes are over, they're not really over, but they come to a climax on Easter, the night before Easter, we call it the Easter Vigil Mass. And the bishop here will, if you're in this parish, he will baptize you and confirm you on the same night. You know? And uh, that baptism is... Uh, if you're not sure if you were baptized or not, sometimes people come here and say, I'm not sure. And so we have what is called a, a conditional baptism. Just, we baptize you uh, in, in case you weren't, you, you weren't baptized, you know, because some people come from churches that uh, they don't say the proper form, you know. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some people say, oh, I was baptized in a church where they said, in the name of Jesus. Yeah, with those church buses, like when I was little, I, for some reason, me and my family or my cousins, we got on one. And we were, um, you know, I think it was like evangelical or something. Mm-hmm. Like, and then when we were there at the end, they said, who wants to be saved? And so, me as a child, I just wanted to feel sure. God's presence. So mm-hmm. I went up, and then my cousin stopped me and said, no, they're trying to baptize you here. And, you know, because he was yeah. baptized in the Catholic Church, he knew that it wasn't like the right way. So he stopped me from actually going <laughs> <laughs> and getting drenched in the water. And here now you're waiting still. Yeah, now I'm here. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> all, in all, in God's, all in God's plan. Yeah. yeah. Good. So yeah, and I think you guys will, uh, your first confession will be sometime in Lent. So, if I'm available, on my finger. But now you guys know Father. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Just, so he's your friend. You, yeah. can, you can talk to him anytime you want. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Don't ever be afraid to talk to a priest. You know? Good. They look a little funny, they dress different, but they're, they're pretty much like you and I. <laughs> Any more questions? Or... Any questions? You okay, Tim? Mm-hmm. Tim is it? Yeah. Tim. All right, good. Next week's class is back at the uh, other, the St. Augustine's, I believe. 
I believe it's also a I made a mistake this morning. I got up and drove to St. Augustine's. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that I, I should have opened my book before I left the house. I would have known it was here. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got almost here. did, but yeah. Sister Tess sent us that email. Yes, yeah, that was the email, so I just went and dropped off the little one, and then I came. And well, Robert reminded me, he's like, it's a cathedral, well, don't forget. Read your emails and everything, because with this pandemic, things could shut down quickly. Oh, especially. It's getting really bad. I pray that we don't. It is getting worse. We are having, even nurses, we're having tests. Everyone at the hospital, we're actually told 